Okay, so I will try to be uh, to be short. Um, th this presentation is is really about a project we've done and the feedback in the, in IoT and M2M uh, use cases. So a short presentation. What we do is we have an open source platform, and that open source platform is used to deploy enterprise application for M2M um, uh, solutions, essentially web-based, and uh, it's always GI-based on the server, which is interesting. Um, it's heavily modular, heavily dynamic, and I think uh, it's, it's an important thing for network management and M2M solutions. So uh, the project we've been involved in to our M2M especially in home automation and smart grid, uh, smart grid especially for automated demand response in the energy uh, market and uh, smart metering. So uh, projects like a uh, small prototype in home automation and, and smart grid going to uh, large deployments like um, we, we're working with uh, Veolia for um, uh, the monitoring of the, the network of 1.5 million Measures in France, so it's it's a real on production and uh, quite heavy project, and of course, <coughs> those uh, those are demanding projects. Those are uh, things, as uh, Jan said, um, it's not easy, it's challenging, and uh, this presentation is really about the feedback, of why and uh, where we we could have done better. So, in my opinion, those projects falls into two categories. The first one, which uh, working by pure luck, and the second one is working with way too much work. Uh, it's uh, those projects are successful. I mean, we're working with big telco operator, with uh, with Schneider, with uh, uh, energy utilities. So they are really, really good, really nice. But uh, nonetheless, they are they are difficult and they are challenging. What did not work uh, is using proven technology in the design way. So, for example, uh, soap didn't work in M2M in IoT doesn't work. Uh, database for storage difficult. HTTPS for secure communication doesn't work. What did work or saved us is thing that were used in a very counterintuitive way. So for example, uh, OSGI on the server. We talk a lot of OSGI on the devices. We look at the uh, Orange solutions and so on. Uh, but using OSGI on the server was really a, a time saving and solution saving uh, thing. Uh, XMPP for machine to machine communication. XMPP is a chat, it's, it was designed for human-to-human -human communication, not for machine-to-machine. -machine. Nonetheless, it proved, it proved uh, useful. OpenVPN for server-to-machine secure channels. Uh, again, OpenVPN was designed for point-to-point -point or for uh, client-to-server uh, securing uh, channel, secure <coughs> channel communication, not for server-to-machine. To, <laughs> server and of course, using open source projects just to qualify usage and technologies, open source projects and open source hardware also, to make sure that we could use um, packages, Linux things, stuff, uh, to evaluate technologies and to make sure it could, it could be used. So it's almost the opposite, where proven technology didn't work, whereas uh, the others, uh, unproven, new, using counterintuitive, did work. So in my opinion, IoT is really about thinking the opposite. And why is that? In the regular internet, the server has the data. The client sends a comment. And the server sends the data. So it's really client to server. And everything is organized around that. Security, communication, data storage, uh, and, and implementation of, of the different layers in the architecture. Well, in the IoT, device has the data through actuators, through um, uh, sensors. The device sends the data, or collects some data, or do some stuff. And the server sends the command. So everything is reverted. And of course, that creates challenges. So if you have to think everything is reverted, you have to understand that everything is different. And if you plan the, the regular way, 
with everything you learn, everything you your experience, it's just not it's just it's not going to work. So the challenges we've seen, and um, it's uh, feedback, and it's also calls for solutions, uh, especially in the Eclipse group and so on. So storage and data analysis, communication and security, the challenge, and uh, deployment and architecture. So let's start by the last one, of course, which is architecture and deployment. Uh, device, where to put the code, basically. The question is always, do I put the code on the device? Do I put the, the code on the server? Is it cloud-based? Is it device-based? Where, where do I put that? First, my, my opinion and my advice would be plan for both and plan for change. Because somebody is going to say, no, we, we need to move that from server to client or to device. So to be able to plan for change, you need modular and dynamic design. Like the iPopo uh, solution we've seen uh, in the last presentation, it's Python, it's component-based, so that's that's the kind of interesting things. Modular, ubiquitous technologies are cool because if they can run on device, they can run on the server, then you can move back and forth where the code, where the optimization, where the components, where the algorithm are. JavaScript was designed to be on the client. Well, JavaScript is uh, more and more used on the server with Node.js solutions. We have embedded for a long time JavaScript on our platform, so we can move back and forth things like that. OSGI on the device on the server. Again, code can be deployed on the device, move back to cloud, because we need interaction with cloud-based services or come back to, to the device. Now, Linux, of course, on a device, on a server. Storage. Storage is a, is a significant problem because all of that data that comes from the devices, uh, it, it ends up with a huge amount of data. And of course, you've got to plan for that. Every time and very quickly, you will end up millions of rows. Um, hundreds of millions of rows uh, in, in, the, in the storage. So just because every device sends a lot of data, and we've got a lot of devices. So we've got anywhere from hundreds, thousands, millions of devices. So if you've got just uh, 1.5 million meters, if they just send a few information per day, it's uh, it's millions of rows that comes every day, and you've got to process. So in database, quickly show limitations, and uh, there is a theory. And uh, basically, if you've got huge amount of data, you need to put them on multiple servers. You need to scale. You need to do what uh, the last presenter said about scalability and deploying on multiple servers. The problem is, in database, you've got three things: partition tolerance, which is multiple server, consistency, and availability. And availability and consistency, the crossing of these two is where relational <coughs> databases are. Partition tolerance is where you need to be if you've got a huge amount of data. And at the crossing of the three, it's just there is no solution. So you've got to give up this one or this one. And if, you've got the, if you give up this one, then you've got a set of solutions. If you give up this one, you've got a set of solutions. Or you forget <coughs> about getting all the data back to the server, and then you skip you keep the database. But at the end of the day, somebody will have to give up some requirement. So if you pile up requirements from everybody, then you will end up in the not possible area. Communication and security, and it's it's a uh, it's it's a it's a feedback. It's also a call for something more secure and more simple. So uh, usually, what we've seen in in our project is corporate security is organized for client server to communication. So what I say, clients and communication to data. So. They assume, corporate security assumes that attacks coming from the outside, so you've got a big secure firewall, 
uh, communication inside to outside is usually easy, sometimes blocked, but usually easy. Uh, communication outside to inside, almost impossible. So if you've got a cloud solution and devices, then you need to send information from the cloud solution to devices, and those devices are in the corporate network, then you've got a problem. So you've got a firewall and proxy problem. And for the home security, uh, it's usually not devices, typical boxes, configured by nobody, which means it's admin, admin, and login and password, right? Uh, good news, those devices can't be accessed easily from the outside. Bad news, those devices can't be accessed easily from the outside. So for cloud-based solution, it's, it's an issue, right? If you've got devices, or you communicate easily with those, and all you secure those networks. So if I look at my home, I took uh, an example, and uh, what I've seen is a number of chats, unexpected with buddies, uh, Linux boxes, unsecured with outdated kernels, and um, unsecured traffic from the from outside to the outside to servers, sending data, uh, UDP packets, and so on. So my naive thinking, naive initial thinking, was chatting my daughter, of course. Um, Linux boxes, an old PC sticking out arm, and of course uh, unsecured with the outside my son. Suspect the kids first, sure. Um, so I look at my network <coughs> and see what's, what's in there. So we've got four computers, two tablets, five not so smartphones. One, um, I'm living in Lyon, so I'm the lucky uh, <laughs> uh, experimenter of uh, Linky, so which is a smart meter doing by, uh, done by ERDF. I've got also a smart water meter, an Apple TV, a smart Samsung TV, um, home processor cinema, projectors, smart also, a Blu-ray player, so which for Java VM, internet radio, connected, printer, home automation server, and of course, uh, intelligent Zigbee radiators. So it's a lot of stuff, um, by the way, all those devices consume a few watts of power in standby mode. One watt equal one euro per year. Okay? So five watts times 15 is 100 euro. I cut a number of devices. I had 300 watts of standby power. So I cut a number to get down. Uh, 300 euros per year for one house per millions of people. That's billions of dollars of wasted energy. Uh, Apple TV is 0 0.5 watt, which is very minimal, interesting. So in my home, unexpected chat with buddies, the reality is the printer using XMPP with HP servers. Linux boxes with outdated kernels, well, uh, almost all of them. The radio is a Linux box, the TV, the Blu-ray, and the home cinema. And secure traffic with outside server, the home automation server, right? So security today, uh, you've got to assume, I think it's a huge unsolved challenge. First, uh, command security rules prevent easy deployment of M2M solutions. So I think we need to understand better uh, what needs to be done to deploy easily, securely, and accepted by corporate security when it's deployed in the, in the um, enterprise, uh, something that doesn't break the common rules. And by the way, M2M ubiquity also creates threats because you've got Linux box and I'm going to tell you, with a Linux box, I can do everything on your network. It's just a matter of tweaking it to be able to access the outside, establish VPN communication, 
I mean, it's, it's really easy. And uh, if corporate security guard discovers that they've got Linux with routing capabilities that can be infected on their network, they're going to be more aggressive as far as the rules are concerned. And it's going to be more and more difficult. So somewhere we need to find a solution. In the, uh, in the, in the meantime, I think we should definitely plan for security. So firewall travel soon, XMPP, HTTP pool, VPN, those are ALF's baked solution act that can be used to uh, do that kind of thing. But first and more important, just you got to assume everything is hostile. Those devices can send bad packets. So it's not acceptable to have the automation server sending and encrypted traffic to uh, the central servers. By the way, I disconnected that guy. So my call is to, uh, we need a better communication and security scheme. We need bidirectional communication with firewall traversal. And there are solutions. I'm not saying that there are none. There are, but there needs to be easy to use and easy to deploy at home and the enterprise. Uh, we, so that means probably better secure protocol and implementation. So getting back to that uh, map of project, uh, probably needs to be, something needs to be uh, uh, there. Of course, those challenges create opportunities as well. So uh, again, it's a very challenging for a single project, for a single team. So that means um, I think we need to share code and experience. Uh, we need to better understand capabilities and limitation from every library, every layer, every pieces of technology. It needs to really understand what's inside, what's in there, limitation. Because at the end of the day, since you need to put everything in reverse, you will have to push the limits of every technology block, patch, go beyond what they've been designed for. So my opinion, it's not about procurement of open source, it's just that technically and from the architecture, I don't think we can do without open source library because we need to understand how they work. We need to make them work in a way they were not designed to. And we need to understand uh, the fix backs. So we need to get access to code. Any questions?